Assalamu alaikum students. So today we start with uh, how the kidney regulates osmolarity. And as mentioned before, the way to deal with osmolarity, uh, the kidney basically uh, manipulates water. So this lecture is part of a two lecture series where first we will talk about, we will introduce uh, what we mean by water balance. Um, and these are the learning objectives. Today we'll uh, review some of the stuff that we did in the first lectures when we started uh, this renal unit where we talked about ECF osmolarity and volume. Uh, this is stuff that you should be now very familiar with. Uh, then we'll move on to CNS centers which are uh, involved in osmoregulation. Uh, we'll look at these two, mainly osmoreceptors and thirst center. Uh, then we'll uh, uh, review ADH, antidiuretic hormone, uh, in detail. Where does it come from? Uh, what does it do? Uh, and what are the consequences? Uh, which are the conditions in which ADH, uh, without ADH, you won't be able to uh, uh, deal with those situations. It's crucial. Uh, and at the end, uh, we, will dis we, will, we will go through some overviews of how kidney deals with uh, uh, overhydration where there is abundance of water and dehydration uh, when there is water uh, scarcity, uh, details of which specifically renal response to dehydration we'll be talking about tomorrow, uh, which is that famous uh, issue or question of how does the kidney uh, concentrate urine. All of that action will be tomorrow, but this crucial uh, lecture basically uh, introduces the whole thing and gives you some very important details about uh, how where the CNS is uh, uh, in terms of osmoregulation, uh, what does ADH do, and the very important overviews of this whole osmoregulatory scenarios. Right, so this is that stuff which we have discussed. Uh, please remember, that whenever we talk about ECF volume, we are uh, uh, looking at primarily, not exclusively, primarily sodium. So it's sodium uh, uh, homeostasis, uh, uh, that is how kidney basically regulates ECF volume in the, in the body. And by manipulating water, controlling water homeostasis, it deals with changes in ECF osmolarity. Okay. So now we are we are basically coming. Our focus is now uh, on water primarily through most of this lecture, and uh, here we see that uh, in in women uh, again the 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 standard is to take the 60 kg woman and uh, the 70 kg man. This is uh, tradition, uh, convention rather than medicine. Uh, so a 60 kg woman uh, holds about 30 liters of body water, uh, and a 70 kg man about 42 liters, uh, and roughly. Uh, most of this water is inside the cells, about three liters in plasma, remaining remaining 11 is in the station. Again, this is information that you should already know from those first lectures. Uh, this, I found it, it's, it's a good diagram uh, to, to tell you how the homeostasis is achieved. If you look at this, input and output is basically, you, is, is supposed to be zero. So whatever water you take in and whatever you give out, they, it, it should be in balance so that there is no net gain of water because net gain of water as the theme of this lecture now will sort of affect your osmolarity. Okay, so you should not have a net gain or loss of water because that has now that you should now be clear that that has direct relationship with osmolarity. Okay, try to build that concept in the mind. Secondly, what you need to understand is that uh, the body can, uh, the, the kidneys cannot invent water, quote unquote, okay? They can only conserve water. Uh, the introduction of water is mainly by uh, gaining water. You, you drink water, okay? Uh, and, and, and basically it's in the food and drink. Uh, some of it, very, very few of it is the, is, is the result of metabolism. So this is the uh, average amount of, of course, the temperature varies, but you're talking about a moderate temperature, atmospheric temperature. Uh, you 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 basically gain 2.5 liters a day on an average, and the same is lost by insensible loss through sweating, etc., through lungs. Urine is the main output of water uh, every day, 
then you lose some in pieces as well. Uh, the bottom line is both they both need to be uh, balanced out so that osmolarity uh, is constant. Okay, so now we're talking about uh, the entire system of water homeostasis. Uh, uh, remember that uh, uh, ADH, osmoreceptors and ADH, this is where the, the uh, kidney will be discussed uh, extensively. Uh, thirst center is a, is a CNS center which uh, is uh, basically to do with uh, drinking behavior. So uh, this, this uh, does not have uh, uh, directly anything to do with the kidney. However, this is where the kidneys mentioned would be extensive. Okay, that's one thing. Second thing is that osmoreceptor ADH and IE kidney, this, all of this is geared towards uh, reabsorption of water or letting go of water. So if you are overhydrated, the kidney will let go of extra water and the osmolarity will be maintained. Uh, conversely, if water is deprived in the atmosphere, if you, you are water deprived, then kidney will conserve extra water, which would have rolled out uh, under normal circumstances. Uh, the kidney will in this case uh, conserve that water and hence uh, osmolarity again will be maintained. So the, the, main, the main point of, of this system, this whole system is uh, water uh, management okay, uh, of already present water or the lack of it in the body. It does not have much to do with drinking or water intake. That's mainly the role of the thirst center. Okay, the thirst center basically uh, regulates your drinking behavior. Okay, now this is uh, drinking behavior can be psychogenic. Some people just drink water without the need of water. They they probably surf the internet too much. Uh, they look up uh, health articles which are not uh, totally scientifically based many times. And uh, the a, a generic uh, message is that you should keep yourself well hydrated. And and this these health messages so called. Uh, are uh, not very detailed in the sense that when should you uh, uh, keep yourself more than usual hydrated and what is the meaning of well hydrated anyway okay so whenever you feel thirst that's the signal of the body to in to take water in if you're drinking water anyway then then that's that you're going to lose that water uh, you're not going to uh, benefit from it uh, hugely so we are not talking about that behavior where you just carry on a bottle and you just keep on drinking it. We are talking about the, uh, the, uh, the, the drinking that is required and that is generated by an actual center in the CMS, which uh, uh, responds to osmolarity, okay? So this, the, the arrangement of the lecture is, uh, we will be discussing this first and then this. We will be ending on the third center. Okay, so this is an overview of where the CNS stands in this whole saga of osmolarity regulation. So what he has done is he has blown up uh, this part, uh, the hypothalamus part uh, here, or rather this whole thing here. So this is the magnification. This is the pituitary, as you can uh, recognize. Uh, this is the stalk of the pituitary and the, the, the master planner, the hypothalamus, is, in, is nicely tucked away, uh, looking over, not just anatomically, but very, very much physiologically speaking, looking over the pituitary gland. And you can see all sorts of connections here. So let's just go in sequence. These, this area here, this is the osmoreceptors. So these are receptors which basically sense uh, the blood osmolarity. Okay, so that's, this should be very clear. Osmoreceptors, our area is the area of the hypothalamus which senses the, it's a, it's a receptor, so it obviously senses something, it senses blood osmolarity. Blood, blood uh, osmolarity goes up, blood osmolarity comes down. These are the receptors which pick the signal up and once they pick the signal, they stimulate supraventricular nucleus which is a famous nucleus of the uh, hypothalamus uh, you have uh, read this uh, uh, in hypothalamus when we're discussing the limbic system. 
And then there is a pair of anterior nucleus. Again, it should be similar, uh, so familiar now. We, or we, we covered it when we were discussing the pair of uh, limbic system. So these two nuclei come into play when we are talking about ADH. Okay. So osmoreceptors, when they get stimulated or when they get uh, destimulated, they affect supraventricular and paraventricular nuclei, which uh, share uh, ADH secretion. More two thirds of ADH secretion happens in supraventricular, uh, supraoptic nuclear neurons, and paraventricular is responsible for one third of the uh, uh, secretion of ADH. Now, both of these, remember, ADH is formed here. It is then transported by this tract and stored in the posterior pituitary and then gets released here in the blood. Okay, so it's a neuroendocrine hormone. A few words of caution ADH is not manufactured, not made in the posterior pituitary. It is made in the hypothalamus, stored in the posterior pituitary. Please make a note of that. Okay, now, second. There are only few hormones which are called neuroendocrine hormones. ADH is one of them. The other is oxytocin. Oxytocin also is manufactured here in the hypothalamus and transported in a similar fashion and stored in the posterior pituitary till the signal comes and it's released. Okay. So these two hormones are, are famous and distinct uh, in the sense that they are called neuroendocrine hormones. Now, what do we mean by that? We, what we mean is that look they are formed by neurons and yet they're hormones it's an off throwing uh, uh, line isn't it what are classically how are hormones uh, defined hormones are substances okay which have specific functions which are released by glands right endocrine glands directly into blood and then they are carried away and they do their business these are this is a classical definition of gland uh, of uh, hormones okay but here you don't see a gland you see neurons and now what are neurons what do neurons make and what is that called neurotransmitters right the neurons make neurotransmitters sympathetic neurons make norepinephrine norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter however here there's a special case now these are those exceptions which need to be remembered here neurons are making a substance which is carried away by blood. Now, if, if, a, if, some, if somebody makes something and is carried away by blood, that qualifies it to be a hormone by definition. However, now this, this thing that has produced it is not a gland, but it's a neuron. So we make another category for this. We say that it's a neuroendocrine system or neuroendocrine hormone produced by neurons, taken away by blood, so it's like it's it takes something from both worlds neural world and hormonal world okay so that's that please do uh, keep in mind uh, these connections these are very important connections uh, is uh, interestingly uh, this whole system has has a has a link uh, from the vasomotor center which you remember from circulation uh, the baroreceptor reflex uh, which brings in uh, pressure related information from the blood vessels to the vasomotor center this has an input on both nuclei as you can see clearly from here and we'll, we'll be talking about this in a bit okay so these nuclei finally these nuclei are under two influences one is the plasma osmolarity which is mediated through osmoreceptors and then there is plasma volume acf volume I, I, sorry acf volume not plasma specifically it's the entire cvs as uh, ecf so ecf volume uh, information is being communicated from the VMC while the ECF osmolarity is being conveyed by conveyed via osmo receptors and then you have the ADH secretion from these uh, nuclei which is adjusted according to these two stimuli please remember that mostly this whole system is set is 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 triggered or inhibited mainly the main stimulus is osmolarity ECF osmolarity and less so uh, is the uh, is blood volume in certain another way it is uh, uh, very less uh, sensitive to changes in blood volume as compared to or when compared with changes in osmolarity it's more sensitive to osmolarity plus uh, ecf osmolarity
Okay. So we've talked about uh, ADH. Uh, ADH, uh, another name is uh, vasopressin or arginine vasopressin, AVP. You may find in some books, ADH is written as AVP. Arginine is again a, a, a typical composition of this hormone uh, biochemically. Vasopressin is, is, a, is a good term in the sense that uh, it, it, it gives you a, a, a flavor of, the, uh, of this uh, hormone. And ADH is basically, it's, uh, it's functional, the uh, abbreviation also, it also has its function in it, anti-diuretic hormone. So if diuresis is, is the, is, is the uh, act of uh, releasing urine or uh, getting uh, water out through the urine, anti-diuretic uh, means that something, this hormone basically uh, inhibits that, inhibits the uh, outflow of water or limits it and promotes the, very importantly, reabsorption of water, okay? So ADH is to do with reabsorption of water, okay? As we'll see. Now this is a uh, rather busy looking slide, but uh, this is uh, just about everything that you need to know about ADH. And hence I've put all of this in one slide, okay? Uh, right, so we start with the, the anatomy first, okay? Let me just readjust this. Right, this. So this now is we have we have come to a schematic diagram. You can see the hypothalamus. You can see the tract. Uh, then you can see the posterior pituitary. Uh, AVPC. It says AVP here, arginine vasopressin. This is basically ADH made and packaged in neurons of the supraventricular and paraventric uh, supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei. These uh, vesicles then are transported and then are stored here, where they can be picked. Uh, released in the blood. This is something that we've just done. Okay. Now, uh, coming to what? What shall we do first? Uh, let's 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 tick this off. Uh, plasma osmolarity. We know that this is the normal range, 280 to 300, and see how sensitive vasopressin uh, ADH releases as you increase uh, plasma osmolarity. ADH secretion goes up. So that's that's that. We've done that. Coming to this now, this is a nice, extensive, uh, not extensive, but nice schematic flowchart. And look at the key first. The yellow sort of this shape is the stimulus. This this rectangle, uh, its uh, color code may not be appreciated over uh, probably over YouTube, but let me let me tell you that this stuff, right? This here, these three boxes, they are the sensors. Okay, then these boxes are the input signal. This is the in integration center. This is the output, and this is the target, tissue response, and then systemic response. It will all make sense when we do uh, do this, solve this. So we, we said that ADH basically is released uh, in relation with osmolarity. This is a nice line, one line to remember, high osmolarity or low blood pressure causes ADH secretion. A nice night, high osmolarity or low blood volume or both, okay? Now, uh, before we do this, let's do the osmolarity thing because it's most sensitive to osmolarity, okay? Anything greater than 280 milliosmol per liter, ADH should release normally, okay? Uh, where, is the, 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 where is the sensor of this? It's hypothalamic osmoreceptors, as we just discussed. Uh, which is the input signal uh, interneurons of the hypothalamus. Uh, all of this is happening in the hypothalamus, the neurons in the hypothalamus. We've talked about the two sets of neurons. What is released in relation to this stimulus? ADH is released. Its, its secretion is enhanced, increased. Okay. Where do, what does it do? What is the target? Uh, uh, output signal is, uh, is collecting duct epithelium. Uh, what happens over there when ADH goes there? It inserts water channels, or or they're called aquaporins. Okay, uh, aquaporins or water channels are inserted. We'll talk about that in a bit. And then they're inserted. You you are now have you have now the power <clears throat> to increase your water reabsorption, to conserve it uh, in a situation of dehydration. Remember, the osmolarity was increased, so you have a situation where you have less water 
to solute ratio okay so you need to conserve water to bring this osmolarity back to normal okay now this would not have been possible if adh wouldn't have been there to ins but to 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 use its power or magic so that you can uh, squeeze out the extra water uh, from urine which you wouldn't have done if the osmolarity was okay okay so in other words when osmolarity increases you take out from the urine more water than you would usually do how is that possible well there are two reasons i'll give you one right now adh related aquaporin insertion in the collecting duct enables you to pick up more water than your usual scheme of things okay the other i will let you know in, in as we flow along okay right so we we've solved this uh, flow chart uh, uh, on osmolarity now let's quickly see what's happening here decreased blood pressure uh, uh, or any uh, due to any volume loss or whatever uh you see that what what who brings the signal who gets uh, disturbed by this the receptor is carotid and aortic barrel receptors remember we mentioned barrel receptors in the initial diagram as well uh, the sensory neuron of the hypothalamus picks this up hypothalamus then starts making adh uh, remember this is new information for you uh, what you read is the barrel receptors take information to the bmc in the in the brain stem and and you have all sorts of sympathetic or anti sympathetic responses which brings the blood pressure down or up what whatever is required now you are studying that that's not the only thing decreased blood pressure do so this is important and crucial information for you which you need to add to your blood pressure scenario okay so when you decrease blood pressure not just uh, is the vmc become uh, become uh, the boss uh, you also have that signal uh, sent to hypothalamus which then starts to if there is a decreased blood pressure scenario then the then the hypothalamus will start to make vasopressin and then vasopressin will do its whole whole thing of, of, similarly to what it did with the decrease in osmolarity uh, increase in osmolarity in this decreased scenario adh will be released it will conserve water and uh, that water will go to see the uh, ecf volume make up for it increase the blood pressure simple okay now uh decrease atrial stretch due to so there are atrial atria this is the heart atria have stretch receptors in built in their walls if there is decreased volume of blood these stretch receptors pick up that signal and then send it off to hypothalamus hypothalamus makes adh the same thing happens water is conserved ecf volume is accommodated enhanced and hence Uh, uh those that stretch uh, or lack of stretch uh, uh, uh signal by the atrial receptor is uh, is uh, is uh, uh, snubbed or it's worked against so these are the main things the main being osmolarity and blood pressure responses on the release of vasopressin or adh right so we've been talking a lot about kidney and this is obviously a kidney class so we 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 will now see uh, and i and i thought i will discuss it right here so that when uh, in in ugaitan does it <clears throat> a bit differently but i think uh, you should know this as part of your info diagram on adh so you know all you need to know about adh so whenever any book mentions adh does this does that you you know what adh the holistic picture of adh is that's why i put everything here Uh, so next time i will just mention that adh increases i will expect you to under, i will expect you to respond or understand when we say that adh increases this happens in the kidney okay so today and mainly tomorrow we'll be talking a lot about adh increases in scenarios where adh is increased please remember that when you talk, think about the kidney and adh this is the diagram which becomes operational okay now check this out adh came from the blood obviously okay these this these small boxes is adh this is where we start so the adh came in it got uh, 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 transported into the interstitium uh, where it found the collecting duct cell with its receptor 
it connects with the receptor please do read up on which are the receptor types and this that the other that is that is a tutorial material and you need to read up on this yourself as well uh, uh, so vasopressin binds to its membrane receptor there is a uh, there is an intracellular change in, uh, which is mediated by cyclic amp and and that basically activates the receptor and the second messenger system which you will be uh, read detail about in endocrinology but let me just say that second messenger systems are intracellular messenger systems which which are linked with their uh, 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 typical receptors when you uh, activate the receptor you basically not just activate one thing in the cell by uh, al by allowing the key of this receptor to come and connect with it which in this case is vasopressin uh, you are activating a whole cascade of intracellular reactions called the secondary messenger system second messenger system okay so in this case that second messenger system is being played out by the cyclic amp which whose level it increases when you activate the adh receptor with adh uh, now there are the storage vesicles which are uh, uh, which have AD, uh, aquaporin stored in them they are activated because of this signal they are already remember they are already pre made as well not just these uh, this also activates the formation of aquaporins aquaporins are proteins right so who will make them who who, who makes proteins in the cell the transcription process so specific genes aquaporin genes are activated which are transcribed then translated and their formation also increases but that takes time so that's why we have pre-made stuff already available for immediate release and then that genetic machinery also gets started to make more and new uh, aquaporins so that uh, you if you need it uh, in the current scenario it, it becomes available in a few hours uh, but uh, you will need it anyway so the things that have been used up are replenished by the newly formed aquaporin vesicles right so these aquaporin uh, vesicles when they are activated by the secondary messenger system they go and they basically fuse with the uh, uh, with the apical side uh, the lumen side of the collecting duct uh, when they fuse with the membrane what they contain the aquaporin itself it gets plugged into the uh, membrane the apical membrane like this so this is the vesicle it got activated it is it contains aquaporin it became when it became activated it fused when it fused it basically forced its content in it pegged it inside in the membrane so now you have a channel of water which you induced which you have created just now which wasn't there before so this is an additional water channel now in this membrane through which extra water can be transported and reabsorbed. Okay, so this is that overview of what um, ADH does and how does it increase water reabsorption. This is how it increases water reabsorption. Uh, again, a word or uh, to, uh, to note important point is since it's all of this business is uh, hormone related, hence it's reversible. Okay, water reabsorption via say uh, paracellular pathways to the tight junctions is constant you can't do much about that it's a constant feature uh, it's like uh, you have a window in your wall that's a hole right that's a hole in the wall it's constant uh, if you drill a hole in the wall and then uh, use plaster of paris to plug it then dislodge the plug then plug it then dislodge the plug let's say that is a reversible hole in the wall but the window the whole window is irreversible let's say let's assume that it's irreversible so there are pathways for water transport which are fixed you can't do anything about that however this adh mediated aquaporin system is reversible so uh, you've understood what happens when adh comes in now if you think about think about if adh now decreases in the blood now that you have reabsorbed water, obviously it's a negative feedback mechanism. So when you have water reabsorbed in the blood eventually, and that increased osmolarity scenario is now addressed, osmolarity goes back to normal. The, the vasopressin will obviously drop in the blood. 
yes this whole reaction will drop yes aquaporins will stop being inserted into the membrane their levels will drop and hence this newly created temporary water extra water reabsorption scheme that you concocted this also vanishes okay so this is a reversible water uh, reabsorption business which comes only into play when you need it by meddling with osmolarity increasing vasopressin and this that the other okay remember this the rest of the water reabsorption is constant you need to have an obligatory urine volume for which you need to have a constant level of water in the urine uh, the fluctuation in that water is being discussed here okay right so these are the two areas uh, which are postulated to be thirst centers uh, similar areas which release adh also uh, are postulated to pick up thirst so when you become thirsty actually these areas are the ones which make you uh, feel that feeling of thirst okay and of course they respond to all those major mechanisms which uh, get adh release so this is a simpler topic just remember the adh uh, triggers uh, they also happen to be the triggers for thirst however in this you have an entry uh, the last two entries are important and interesting as well angiotensin 2 also uh, triggers thirst mind you angiotensin 2 also triggers adh okay angiotensin 2 does a lot of things and uh, if somebody could remind me later on uh, on whatsapp i can uh, put up a, a consolidated diagram for angiotensin 2 as well or maybe the cr can make a note of this please and remind me to whatsapp later uh, we can have a nice one uh, similar to what we did with adh we can have a big uh, one slide uh, uh, in, in, in info slide regarding angiotensin 2 how oh, okay this last thing is very important dry mouth is a is a trigger for thirst and gastric distension is a uh, an inhibitor of thirst now uh, you you must have uh, 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 felt a dry mouth sometimes in your life and this is where we fast or you are in you're traveling or uh, the weather is extremely hot uh, the hot being one of the cities which can get get very hot in the summers uh, dry mouth is not just a a, a thing that you have uh, in physiological terms dry mouth is actually a stimulus for thirst centers it stimulates the the, the afferent information going from a drier mouth goes to the thirst center directly it's one of its most prolific stimulators and it stimulates the thirst center so that you feel the urge to to drink water which immediately wets the mouth and hence this afferent information is now it decreases this is something to note a dry mouth is actually after the information stimulus uh, stimulatory information for thirst center also if you think about it when you drink water the mouth and the upper parts of the of the of the git become wet right so check this out you have a osmolarity issue in the body fluids okay uh, the osmolarity has gone up even more than 300 okay now when you drink water obviously uh, you will feel the urge to drink water along with all that adh business will which uh, would have started uh, automatically but that is subconscious right what is conscious is the feeling the only conscious feeling that you get in an increase of similarity scenario is thirst so what you do you drink water now this water goes through the mouth then the upper uh, esophagus and then down and in the stomach and then so on and so forth but there's a problem the problem is the absorption of water is in this intestine and there's a time lag between you drinking water and its eventual absorption and hence it, it's coming into blood addressing that osmolarity issue bringing the osmolarity back to normal etc etc right but i want you to slow this down and think about the time lag that it takes from drinking water and its absorption this is where the ingenious design 
of the creator in all of us comes to play and it's evident when you drink water and when you absorb water there is a time difference between so by the time the osmolarity actually in the blood gets addressed if if you don't stop drinking water you will swing in the other direction wouldn't you you would over intake water and make your plus make your blood dilute what shouldn't there be a mechanism which stops the drinking urge so that you take just enough water and when you take just enough water which is appropriate to address the osmolarity issue some somebody needs to tell you that okay now you should stop water intake we in in english we call it the thirst has been quenched the, the thirst has gone the, the urge has stopped right when you drink water think about this when you drink water and when you had your fill as we say the thirst quenches however the osmolarity problem is still there but just because of this time delay thing to protect you from diluting your blood the thirst center by detecting the wetness of the mouth and the upper git it turns off the thirst mechanism just in time so it's a protective mechanism so that you don't ingest too much water when the wetness is achieved of the mouth the thirst center inhibits the thirst or decreases it as you are moving fluids through and then when it calculates that okay this is quite enough so you can imagine the thirst center being so intelligent that it actually predicts that okay this amount of wetness i mean we don't exactly understand how it works uh, but we are possible we can postulate that it has uh, it it calculates from the afferent information which is the wetness of these surfaces uh, uh, at run time mind you live uh, right now you not necessarily have adjusted the osmolarity of the blood because it, that will take time uh, so it's just really mainly the wetness and the distension of the stomach by which it can calculate that okay enough water has gone in let's switch this thirst thing off so that the dude uh, stops drinking water so that he doesn't end up diluting his blood okay something to think about it's actually a very cool phenomenon it's uh, when when i first read it when i was your state i was quite fascinated okay so we will end this lecture by uh, doing an exercise uh, the detail of which will be doing tomorrow okay uh, before we do that uh, i would like to remind you something that i mentioned at the start of the tubular function i mentioned something regarding water movement of water <clears throat> if you recall i told you there are no active mechanisms of water movement water basically moves down uh, its concentration gradient or in relation with solutes okay osmosis so water will either go uh, will primarily if you are only talking about water we not talking about solute only water there is absolutely no other way no active transport of 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 water water will always follow that simple diffusion process this can be a problem which i will introduce today and we will properly discuss tomorrow okay in concentration of urine scenario uh, and second is its manipulation through osmosis you you understand both of the simple diffusion and osmosis you you know now very well now let's say this is a issue you need to pause the slide now and observe what's happening here here in this i have not given you the key the key is in the next slide this is something for you to uh, try to try to crack it yourself okay this is a a a a a a flow chart which is basically of decreased plasma osmolarity so you had too much water to drink this is over hydration scenario okay this is dehydration scenario okay if you if you could just pause and solve it by solving i mean just supply increase or decrease arrows for this section of the flow chart 
and this section of the flowchart. Okay, you may pause it, solve it, and then move on. Okay, now moving on, uh, this is the key. So if you just see, you should be able to do it very easily. Uh, if there is a uh, water abundance, the plasma osmolarity drops, uh, it goes below 280. Uh, this should inhibit everything uh, because everything is basically uh, 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 switched or targeted for increase in plasma osmolarity. So when you decrease plasma osmolarity, uh, the osmoreceptors get inhib inhibited uh, ADH secretion goes down. When that goes down, everything that ADH does goes down. And, and concurrently, uh, when you have a, a decreased plasma osmolarity, the thirst center gets inhibited. The drinking gets, you don't feel the urge to drink. And then all these things, they come together and increase plasma osmolarity. A, by decreasing input of more water, new water. And two, very importantly, letting go uh, of water increasing urine volume and getting rid of that extra water will bring down the osmolarity uh, bring up the osmolarity back to its normal uh, situation uh, in this scenario the opposite will happen plasma osmolarity has gone up it stimulates the osmoreceptors uh, it stimulates the whole adh and what it does scenario it also stimulates the thirst center the drinking is on now, you take your, or more water in, you conserve more water and bring back the osmolarity back to normal by diluting the blood, the ECF. Now, the perceptive student will immediately see an issue here. Go on, think about it. Think about what the problem is. And this is related with water being a passive actor you cannot actively pump water there are no donkey pumps in the in the kidney electronic driven donkey pumps okay you have to do it the old-fashioned way so my question to you is would you have a problem here getting rid of extra water or would you have a problem here where you have to decrease urine volume by reabsorbing more than usual water. Is this a problem? And if yes, why? Or is it this a problem? And if yes, why is that? So let me not answer that question. Let me see what you guys do in the comment section. And we will start proceedings from this point onwards in the lecture tomorrow, inshallah. I look forward to your educated guesses or uh, maybe or a bit of your analysis inshallah okay uh, see you then till tomorrow thank you very much assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh